And we're joined now by Salam Amariati. He's the president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And we're going to have a discussion on Islam and the American Muslim community amid the backdrop of the U.S. led military effort against ISIS and other jihadist groups. And Mr. Amariati, uh, we've had calls already today as we've been discussing this subject from viewers mm -hmm. concerned about radicalization of American Muslims. How concerned are you about that scenario in light of ISIS efforts? Well, if one person falls prey to these violent extremist recruiters, that's one too many. Of course, this is a serious problem. Uh, the reality is that uh, these people that do turn towards violent extremism are doing so outside the mosques. Uh, and so we have to have uh, healthy conversations in the mosques to see how we can reach these unreachables. Um, but at the same time, these are a handful of people. We are concerned about it. Um, and at the same time, we believe that the best thing we can do is to fortify the partnership we've had with law enforcement uh, and also uh, foster even stronger relations throughout civil society. You've written that the key to defeating is ISIS is Islam. Explain what you mean by that. Islam means life. ISIS means death. Uh, Islam means mercy. Uh, ISIS means cruelty. It's very simple. Um, and anyone that has any kind of elementary education about Islam knows the difference. And, and if anything, what we see in ISIS is there may be Muslims there, but it is not Islam. Um, what we feel Islam has done to contribute to civilization is being tarnished by groups like ISIS. And so we feel that on the one hand, we have to set the record straight. Uh, on the other hand, we know that there is a grave danger in groups like ISIS uh, rising not only to the region, but in terms of the narrative throughout the world. And President Obama was correct. He said what groups like ISIS do uh, very effectively is they exploit grievances of people, but they lure them into thinking that fighting the way uh, they're fighting in, in such uh, gruesome and cruel manner and barbaric uh, really is, is, is the way to, to fight evil. Um, Islam says to respond to evil with good. So there are so many points uh, in Islam that we can actually use as an antidote to the ideology of ISIS. And we also know, and I think many military experts have said, that we cannot defeat ISIS militarily. Uh, we have to deal with the ideas. And so it is a battle of ideas, and we feel that American Muslims um, have that ability to help uh, in this war on terror. You bring up President Obama talked about some of these issues last week at his speech before the United Nations General Assembly. Here's a bit from that speech in which he called on Muslims to speak out against extremist ideology. It is time for the world, especially Muslim communities, to explicitly, forcefully, and consistently reject the ideology of organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It is one of the tasks of all great religions to accommodate, devote faith with a modern, multicultural world. No children are born hating, and no children anywhere should be educated to hate other people. There should be no more tolerance of so-called clerics who call upon people to harm innocents because they're Jewish, or because they're Christian, or because they're Muslim. It is time for a new compact among civilized peoples of this world to eradicate war at its most fundamental source, and that is the corruption of young minds by violent ideology. Islam al mariati is the president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council joining us. Uh, after that speech, uh, do you think enough Muslims are, are speaking up against uh, jihadism? Well, I think we'll call this violent extremism and, and one thing we have to be very clear about we shouldn't be countering jihad we should restore the classical meaning of jihad jihad to the uh, violent extremist means holy war uh, but jihad in classical Islamic terms mean, means struggle so let us uh, at least not use religious terminology in fighting groups like ISIS it just plays into their hands they want this to be a war on, them, on, on Islam uh, a war on religion we should be at war at criminal behavior, war at, uh, against terrorism. 
So rather than dealing with these religious terms, I think we have to isolate them uh, from mainstream Muslim communities. And what I think the president is talking about in terms of violent ideologies, let's face it, uh, there are people in the region of the Middle East that sponsored groups like ISIS. There are groups and powers in the Middle East that have these ideas. And so when we are talking about a battle of ideas, we should confront those groups uh, in the Middle East. And I think American Muslims have that ability to do that. We have the ability to steer the conversation in a different direction so that young minds uh, are not corrupted, so that people's grievances are not exploited, so that we set the record clear on what Islam is, and we show that American Muslims are part of the solution. For folks unfamiliar with your group, what is the Muslim Public Affairs Council? The Muslim Public Affairs Council is aimed at uh, helping to integrate Islam and Muslims uh, within American pluralism so that we become a vibrant and effective group in helping on public policy issues such as countering violent extremism, religious freedom, human rights and democracy in the Muslim world, and also enhance the understanding of Islam to the American public. And how many American Muslims are there in this country? There's estimated between three and six million. No one really knows. Uh, but the fact is there are Muslims in every sector of society now, uh, whether it is in the arts or the sciences, in technology. Uh, and so we see uh, more Muslims being involved in, in civil society. And, and we want that to be a positive contribution to the, the challenges that we're facing today in the 21st century. Salam al-Mariyati joins us for about the next 40 minutes or so to take your questions and comments. Our phone lines are open if you have questions for him. Kevin is up first in Stafford, Virginia, on our line for Republicans. Kevin, good morning. Good, good morning. Uh, this, there's a lot of dancing around the words of, of what this terrorism is. Uh, first of all, Timothy McVeigh didn't have anything to do. He, did, he didn't do that act in the name of Christianity. Timothy McVeigh did that act in the, in the tradition of the government's too big and he was against the government, had nothing to do with his religion. All of the acts of terror that we see in the world today, including the one with chopping off the girl's head just the other day, are in the name of Islam. Um, and, and, and I'm almost done here. I want to make a couple points. Um, the, the jihadists, ISIS, ISIL, whatever you want to call them, I, I know, sir, you are a Muslim, but I'll tell you, these people will kill you just as quickly as they will kill me. Th this is in the name of Islam. And, and when I say dancing around the words, the point I'm trying to make is you can't hide from that. President Obama hides from it, refuses to say what it really actually is. Mr. Al Mariati. Well, first of all, we, we understand that ISIS is ready to kill Muslims. In fact, they've killed more Muslims than, than anyone else. Uh, their objective is ideological cleansing. Uh, they have an ideology that basically declares Muslims as uh, apostates uh, and, and as infidels. Uh, so uh, we understand that problem very well, more than, than anyone else. Uh, number two, anyone can use labels. There are religious groups in, in every uh, religion, really, uh, that uses labels, but the reality is when they uh, violate the number one rule in all religions, and that is to protect life, then they're going against the tenets of the faith. And that's our point. In other words, rather than reacting to ISIS with fear um, and with outrage, what we're calling for is more leadership in America to expose the forgery of ISIS. ISIS is a mafia. Uh, it, it doesn't conduct any martyrdom operations. It is conducting criminal operations. Um, and so let's just set the record cl uh, uh, clear and straight on that issue. Number two, what we're saying is by shedding light on the issue, it will help us as Americans create more leadership in dealing with groups like ISIS more effectively. The reality is we have bombed Iraq, um, you know, the past four administrations, and it has not helped us um, in terms of creating stability in the region. It has not helped us strategically. So we need to do something else besides airstrikes. And what we're saying is we need a campaign to expose 
the forgery of ISIS, and that is a campaign of ideas, that is a campaign of raising voices of the American Muslim community. Anybody can do anything in the name of religion, but when that act is an act of terrorism and an act of criminality, a, crimin uh, uh, a, a criminal behavior, then let us not validate that act with any religion. And is that effort that you're talking about one that should be led from the Muslim community? Is there a way uh, that the, the government can help uh, in this effort? Absolutely. That's a great question. There are American Muslims uh, who are uh, speaking out against this. I, I believe 120 scholars issued a letter last week that is basically deconstructing and exposing ISIS. We ourselves have had several press conferences on that issue, but it doesn't get the, the media attention that it needs. And so we need support from our uh, civic and faith partners, from our government, uh, from media, so that that voice becomes the predominant voice. A and we expose ISIS for what it is, and, and that is a, 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 a we, we render it the marginalization that it deserves, really. Uh, it should not be the predominant voice uh, for Muslims. We, the American Muslim community, and the Muslim mainstream communities throughout the world should be that predominant voice. Kathleen's up next calling in from Pompano Beach, Florida on our line for Democrats. Kathleen, good morning. Good morning. I'm going to open up Pandora box. How about that? I'm an African American. How does this sound to you? Hebrew, Israel, tribe of Judah, forever. All right, we'll go on to uh, Bowie, Maryland. Ola is calling in on our line for Republicans. Ola, good morning. morning. How are you? Good. Good, good. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank your guests for coming on, and I'd and I like to thank you for appropriately uh, um, uh, identifying Democrats as Democrat and not Democratic. So thanks for that. <laughs> They're Democrats. They're part of the Democratic Party. I'm a Republican. I grew up in a two-religion household. My mom's Christian. My dad is Muslim. Read the Quran back and forth. And I chose to be a Christian for a particular reason. But that's, that's neither here nor there. But just by way of background, I wanted to give you a guest uh, a, a sense of the fact that I know what it is that I speak of. When you first opened the statement, you said radicalization is not happening in the mosque. mosque. That is wrong. It does happen in certain, in certain mosques. And I have visited certain mosques, although I am a Christian. So we need to confront that fact. Two, the first gentleman that came on said you were down, dancing around words. And you are dancing around words. The idea is that all the terroristic activities that has occurred in this particular world over the, probably the last 20 years has been done in the name of Islam. That doesn't necessarily mean that the faith of Islam is bad. That doesn't necessarily mean that the faith of Islam particularly is violent. It just so happens that everyone that happens to be a major terrorist or has performed a major terrorist act over the last 20 years happens to be Muslim. So for mu Muslims have to really confront the fact that that there's something within the religion or something within their clerics that they're pulling out of the religion that is allowing people to do what it is that they do. I understand social economic impacts, and I understand the fact that you do have people that are disenfranchised. But for people to kill people in droves, and then for one religion that has seemingly, seemingly produced most of those people to say it's not Islam, there has to be a reckoning of the fact that there's something within the teaching of the faith and allowing some of these clerics to come on and spread this kind of propaganda all the time. All right, Mr. Al Mariotti, do you want to respond? Well, I don't want to get into debate about, you know, religion and extremism. I, I think that we can go to the um, Israeli settlements and find uh, just as vile um, and vitriolic rhetoric uh, amongst the, the settlers there. Uh, and and we, we also have uh, grievances by Muslims that talk about how they have lost so many lives um, by Western powers. But we don't need to go into that, that point. The, the question that I think these people are having is, are there Muslim clerics that are spreading this ideology? And the, the answer is yes. And we need to confront those clerics. And we need to confront that ideology. But there's no other way to do that than to have Muslims confront them. So we, the American Muslim community, are part of that solution. We are being asked by the U.S. government to help in the counter-narrative against groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So the reality is we have to work together. 
And rather than blaming religion, when you blame religion, what you're actually doing is playing into the hands of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. That's their propaganda. Their propaganda is that America is at war with Islam. And for people here to just say, well, we have Muslims who are at war against America and are using religion, that's true. But let us not fall into that trap that we are actually going to go to war against a religion to deal with this problem. Some people think that the solution is to suck Islam out of the Muslim world. Well, good luck if you think that that's going to work. It's not going to work. We have to engage Muslims in the region. We have to deal with this uh, cult of death, with this ideology, with the theology of life, with religion. Uh, and, and to us, that's our, that's our uh, uh, suggestion and, and that, that's our idea. If anybody has a better idea to confront this ideology, we're open uh, to these suggestions. But the reality is, and I think everybody knows it, we have to have Muslims fighting this battle of ideas. Thomas Shipman asks on our Twitter page, what are the common grievances that draw people toward joining radical groups? Well, the common grievances, uh, of course, is the, the violation of uh, the rights of Palestinians. That's usually uh, on top of the list and how the West has completely turned a blind eye to the suffering of Palestinians, uh, how the West has uh, only sided with tyrants um, in the Middle East, and now uh, we, we have uh, uh, secular tyrants and, and tyrants that use religion in the Middle East, and some of them are our strongest allies, and some of them actually sponsor this, uh, this kind of ideology that we find in groups like ISIS. And so the, the, the third uh, complaint would be this double standard, uh, that if uh, these groups are allies, then we turn a blind eye to their human rights violations. Um, and um, uh, if they are not allies, then we, we go and bomb uh, the whole region. These are the grievances. And what we're saying to um, our community and what we're saying to policymakers is we need to have healthy conversations about these issues. Uh, and let's have the healthy conversations in the mosque. Let us, let us invite more young people to have these conversations. Let us not ostracize these people outside the mosque so that they only get this information on the internet. Um, and, and that basically leads to a higher prop propensity for being exposed to the Al-Qaeda uh, ideology or ISIS ideology without um, someone to talk to them about these kinds of issues. Let us channel the energy of young people who are concerned about these issues towards constructive, nonviolent means of dealing with these policy grievances. Uh, these are serious issues, but uh, we have to have these conversations uh, with our policymakers, with our community, with young people, with people who convert to Islam, uh, so they are not continuously fooled um, by the, the propaganda that they see uh, from groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Sam's up next, calling in from New York, New York, on our line for independence. Sam, good morning. Oh, good morning. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, okay. No, I, you know, I, I you know, I've, uh, I've been listening at keeping up with what's going on in the world. You know, as far as the um, terrorism is concerned, and uh, like like the other caller mentioned that a lot of these terrorists they they claim to be Islam. In fact, I have a nephew who's Islam. Uh, he's, uh, he even takes the Hajj to Mecca and so forth. But here's the question i got to ask you. In the Islamic faith, is there any policy of disowning these people? Like, like, like I'm, I'm talking about, like, uh, excommunication. Uh, you know, like, uh, like putting them out of the religion, uh, uh, that they're not Muslim. It, it could, could that help to, to uh, you know to curtail this terrorism if they are disowned as Muslims? Well, in fact, uh, many Muslim scholars have said that ISIS is not a state. We will not recognize it, uh, and it is not Islam. Uh, so we will not even recognize it as any uh, legitimate uh, Islamic group. It, is, it has been delegitimized by uh, Muslim scholars throughout the world. The reality is ISIS has guns. ISIS has uh, some kind of military power. Now they have revenue. So they are a reality, and they're a reality that we'll have to deal with. Um, but the fact is, in time, 
we will deal with the, that issue uh, if more Muslim communities are empowered and become the predominant voice uh, to the world. ISIS is trying to terrorize people and gaining attention as a result, and then spreading uh, intimidation and fear to get more power in the region. We cannot be uh, fearful of that. We have to confront that. Um, excommunicating them uh, from the religion, it's, it's been done. Uh, not in the way other religions do, but they have been delegitim delegitimized. Uh, but the reality is there are going to have to be some changes in the region uh, before groups like ISIS are going to be marginalized, and mainly groups that have sponsored this kind of ideology, groups that have financed this kind of ideology, and we need to expose that as well. We've heard a lot about ISIS efforts to uh, instill Sharia law in the areas that they control. What is Sharia law? Well, Sharia just simply means uh, the path to God. Sharat means the road, and, and so in classical Islamic uh, terms, it's the path to God. It has become the corpus of Islamic law, but the, it's a complex system of jurisprudence uh, similar to uh, Judaism. Uh, however, there are five simple goals uh, of Sharia that have been uh, agreed upon by all Islamic scholars with unanimity. And that is, number one, to protect and preserve life, to preserve freedom of uh, expression, freedom of faith, to have property, the right to property, and the right to family. Uh, and so when you look at those classical goals in Islamic law and you compare them or you measure groups that claim Islam, whether it's ISIS or any other group, um, the fact that they don't protect life, they kill life, uh, already disqualifies, disqualifies them from having any kind of uh, um, legitimacy in terms of Sharia or Islamic law. Um, like Judaism, we, uh, the Quran says that when you save a human life, it's as if you save all of human civilization. And when you kill a human life, it's as if you've killed all of human civilization. So the enormity of killing innocent human beings uh, is very grave in Islam. It's a major sin. Uh, and, and so anyone that goes around and, and, and just um, casually kills people, beheads people, uh, dismembers people and displays their parts uh, on streets. I, I don't see that. You know, forget about religion. It's not even human. They're not even close to being human. So uh, this is very barbaric. Um, and really, uh, we as Muslims are very disturbed when somebody uses our religion to try to justify that kind of barbarism. Worcester, Ohio is next. Bonnie is calling in on our line for Republicans. Good morning, Bonnie. Good morning. I just so totally disagree with everything this man is saying. I was studying the Quran yesterday, and if you study the Quran, you are totally, totally misleading the people on this program because Surah, if you read Surah, it says you are to behead those who do not believe. The ISIS and the Muslim radicals or whatever you want to call are actually doing what the Quran has instructed them to do. Also, Muhammad said, you know, if lying justifies the means of what you're trying to achieve, then that is okay to lie. And this is what you are doing. You are lying right now. You are like saying that the Muslims want to be peaceful. No, they don't. They don't. That, the whole motive is to have an Islamic Muslim world. Well, first of all, these are talking points of uh, anti-Muslim groups, and unfortunately, people who spend way too much time on the Internet uh, believe everything they, they see from these anti-Muslim groups. And, and so these are talking points that we hear uh, too often. Um, and it's very divisive, and, and it's also very destructive, those kinds of ideas, because they not only, that only lead to um, hate crimes and, and hate speech um, against uh, minorities here in America, but uh, they also destroy our pluralism. Uh, they destroy the sense of what America is, and that is bringing many people together to form one society to deal with these ever-growing problems uh, like ISIS. Uh, number two, what, what this woman is saying about the Quran, I know the Quran, I'm a Muslim, 
Nobody needs to tell me what the Quran says or what my religion says. The religion is not talking about beheading. The religion is not talking about lying. I mean, it's just amazing that we have to defend ourselves when people say that we're lying. And this is, again, one of the talking points from many anti-Muslim uh, bigots um, here in America. They say, well, you don't condemn terrorism. And then when they hear you condemn terrorism, they say you're lying. So there's really no way out uh, of that situation. So we have to ignore that kind of nonsense, uh, that kind of fascism, really. And, and we are basically saying Islam stands for life, Islam stands for justice, Islam stands for engagement with other people so that we can create solutions to these kinds of problems, to we can rid our world uh, of the kind of violence that we see from groups like ISIS. And the fact is, it is Muslims there who will have to fill the vacuum once ISIS is eliminated to create a better society for Iraq and for Syria and for the whole region. It is the Muslim community there who is going to be the major U.S. ally in dealing with this kind of problem. So the, the faster we get rid of this anti-Muslim bigotry and remove it as a boulder uh, in the way of effective co uh, countering violent extremism, uh, the better. Uh, what, what this person always did, uh, what, they, what these anti-Muslim bigots do, and this person parroted what anti-Muslim bigots uh, are saying is, they, they cherry pick certain verses that deal with times of war, and then they say that Muslims are, are all about war. Um, the, the fact is, Muslims are about peacemaking if they want to follow the Quran. Uh, any human being that wants to follow religious text can find verses that deal with war. But the reality is, Christians, Muslims, Jews, people of all faiths, they need to come around one theme. And that is, if you believe in one God, then you have to believe in one human family. And if you believe in one human family, then you have to protect life. That is the message that's going to effectively expose the forgery of groups like ISIS and also deal with anti-Muslim bigotry here. Salam al mariati is president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, joining us from Los Angeles this morning for about the next 15 minutes or so, taking your comments and questions. Uh, Ernestine is next, calling in from Plymouth, North Carolina, on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Hello. I was calling and I was listening. I can understand that Obama and his administration going at ISIS, and I understand that well because they are, they, they are terrorists, but it, it would be a whole lot better, we'll say it just like it is, if the Republicans were pulled together, and I know Obama don't do everything to please me, I don't agree with everything he do, but if they were pulled together and stop bickering and fighting up there in the White House, a lot of things would get done. That's Ernestine from North Carolina with her comment. Ed's next in Jackson, Tennessee on our line for independence. Ed, good morning. Hey, i got a couple things here, uh, but from the last, uh, not the last caller, but the last comment from the guest. Uh, religion is regarded by the common man as true, the wise is false, and the rulers is useful. But that isn't what I really called about. I want to ask you, why is risk never mentioned when we talk about terrorism? Like right here, the U.S. Department of uh, of state reports only 17 U.S. citizens were killed worldwide as a result of terrorism in 2011. You got like a 52,000 greater chance, or 35,000 times more likely to die from heart disease from a terrorist attack. And justice would really solve, and I think the guest has mentioned it, justice would solve 90% of all our problems. But uh, C-SPAN, I wish you would get Professor John Mueller back on here. Remember, he had the book, Overblown. All this terrorist stuff, they cannot do away with American life. And all we do, and then I want to read this and I'll get off here from, from a military... Well, Ed, I want to let uh, Salam al uh take your comment on uh, Ed's concerns that some of these threats are, are overblown. Well, the, the reality is they are a handful uh, uh, of people that have gone to join ISIS. But as we said, having one person join ISIS here from the United States is one too many. And in terms of violent incidents that have impacted Americans, um, again, this is the minority of cases. ISIS has killed more Muslims over there uh, than anyone else. Al-Qaeda has bombed mosques. 
uh, and, and bombed uh, markets and Muslim capitals throughout the world. So we understand uh, the enormity of the problem there. But what these groups do is they terrorize individuals um, from the West. So these journalists, for example, these Americans, uh, this uh, Britain, who, who were executed, they do that to terrorize and bait the United States into fighting them so that they can continue in their propaganda that the West is at war with Islam. So on the one hand, we have to uh, deal with this kind of uh, tactic uh, on, their, on their part. On the other hand, the reality is they are a brutal, barbaric uh, force now that occupies a large part of uh, Syria and Iraq, and we'll have to deal with that. But we can only deal with that uh, in a united way. We have to be united against extremism. We have to have a military and a political and an ideological way of dealing with this problem. And they all have to work in concert with one another. When the caller is concerned about uh, threats to the United States, what is the Department of Homeland Security asking of uh, Muslim communities in the United States to, to try to identify uh, threats or, or people uh, who may go over uh, cease to join groups like ISIS? Well, actually, the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. government in general now has uh, shifted its strategy. It is calling for less surveillance of Muslim communities, um, eliminating profiling of Muslim communities, and working on partnerships with Muslim communities. We have to work together, law enforcement and communities, in partnership in dealing with any kind of threat or risk of terrorism on our streets. Number two, they, the strategy now is shifting to empowering communities and building community resilience on these kinds of issues. And the Department of Homeland Security has actually um, uh, applauded and endorsed our program called the Safe Spaces Initiative and is based on the PI model, prevention, intervention, then ejection. Prevention through more civic engagement, having these healthy conversations about these very difficult topics involving violent extremism emanating from the Middle East, having conversations about U.S. policy, uh, directing people towards constructive ways of dealing with that kind of issue. That's prevention. Um, and also a strong Islamic education. Intervention is if we find somebody who's troubled, then we have an infusion of mental health experts, of social service workers, of peer counselors, religious counselors to deal with that individual. Then if we feel that person is going down that path, uh, of violent extremism. We build off-ramps uh, for that person in partnership with government. And then if we feel that person is jo has joined a violent extremist group and is ready to commit an act of violence, we inform law enforcement and they have to deal with it because we're not criminal investigators. That's the PI model. And basically the U.S. government uh, is, is now accepted that strategy and is discussing that throughout the nation in terms of that particular strategy. For viewers interested more on that specific topic, there's a story in today's Wall Street Journal asking, can de-radicalization programs stem the flow of European militants, talking about <clears throat> efforts by countries in Europe. But <clears throat> we have a few minutes left uh, with Salam al-Mariati of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I want to get to as many of your calls as we can. Kathy is in Alexandria, Louisiana, on our line for Republicans. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. Uh, there was a lady uh, a few calls back that had been reading the Quran, and she was pretty much correct. Um, the God of Israel and Allah really bear no resemblance to each other. And I do have another uh, quick comment. I honestly feel that Islamophobia does not exist. Uh, it is a smokescreen designed to uh, stigmatize Sharia phobia. And uh, my Sharia phobia begins where I know for a fact that my daughter is just as good as your son, perhaps even as smart or a little smarter than, because she's been taught to um, respect someone who works to gain her favor. And if she does not, she, uh, she is not worthy of her respect. Salam al uh to the caller's comment, Islamophobia does not exist. Well, first of all, let me just say, God is God. There's only one God. You believe in God the way you want to. I believe in God the way I want to. But he is God. He's the God of all, all creation. Uh, number two, in terms of anti-Muslim bigotry, 
which I like to use that in terms of Islamophobia. We see it all over. It's, 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 it's in our I inboxes uh, of emails. It's the way people disfigure and distort Islam. Now, I agree with you. The major source of this anti-Muslim sentiment is from groups like ISIS, is from groups in the Middle East that exploit Islam uh, to justify their criminal behavior. So I can understand that. But what I'm saying is that for us to deal with that problem, we need the help of American Muslims. We are part of that solution. And so let us dialogue about these issues rather than uh, to, call each other's na uh, to call each other names. When it comes to Sharia and Islamic law, I don't want any law from uh, the Middle East uh, uh, implanted here and supplant supplanting my American Constitution. My American Constitution, my U.S. Constitution, fulfills the obligation for me as a Muslim. So the best thing that I have for me as a Muslim to practice my religion is the Bill of Rights, is the U.S. Constitution. So let us defend that together. Um, and, and that will help, uh, I believe, a, a more flourishing American Muslim community get more involved and more engaged and, and more included in these serious policy-making issues. It needs the help of all of us. So let's stop dividing our country by using religion uh, and let us prevent groups like ISIS uh, from dividing us even further. And when we speak about religion, let's speak the truth rather than trying to say that this religion is bad and this religion is good. Only God knows what is good religion. So let's wait until we We've meet God. We've got time for one more call. Troy is yeah. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on our line for independence. Troy, uh, just a minute or two left here. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question for the gentleman. I see he's a very American Muslim, and I would like him to answer. I have two questions. The first question would be, what uh, the Muslim American community, very American, do they see Israel as a country? And they are a country, and he's very American, so I guess he would answer, you know, to see it as a country, Israel. Mr. al Mariati, just uh, about a minute left if you want to take the caller's question. Of course, Israel is a country, and uh, Israel is a part of the Middle East, and we have to deal with U.S. policy, which uh, considers Israel its strongest ally, and this, that's a reality. So let us deal with that. Um, and more importantly, let us have more dialogue among the Abrahamic traditions, Jews, Muslims, and Christians here, so that we can uh, promote a Middle East policy that is fair to all religions, that uh, respects the human rights uh, of all people. I just want to end by my, my response to the last caller also is that let's leave theology and religion to God. He will tell us what, what is right and what is wrong. And what he tells us to do, if we believe that our religion is right, let's show it by doing good work. Let, let's show it by spreading the good word uh, and preserve our great plural, pluralism, even enrich it here in America, and be better Americans for it. Salam al Mariati is the president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. It's mpac.org. Thanks for your time uh, up you. early in Los Angeles this morning. My privilege. Thank you very much. And up next on the Washington Journal, our Big Ten college tour continues as we take viewers to Ann Arbor, Michigan, to talk with the president of the University of Michigan. But first, a news update from C-SPAN Radio. It's 9.13 a.m. Eastern Time. Well, John Podesta, a senior advisor to President Obama, speaking earlier at a news conference at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, says Afghanistan will sign a deal tomorrow allowing American soldiers to remain in that country past the end of the year. Mr. Podesta said he didn't know if the newly inaugurated president would be the official signing the deal for Afghanistan, but he said he would sign it on behalf of the United States. The deal will allow about 10,000 American troops to stay in the country after the international combat mission ends on December 31st. Meanwhile, President Obama spending the day at the White House and later attends a DNC fundraising roundtable. CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Mark Knoller tweets that there will be no press coverage of the fundraiser, but he says the approximately 25 supporters are paying up to the FEC maximum contribution of $32,000 $400 per person. 
And Vice President Biden announcing an administration award today of nearly half a billion dollars to community colleges that are partnering with employers on job training. A community college in Massachusetts and Wisconsin's Chippewa Valley Technical College are the largest recipients. They'll each get about $20 million. The vice president and the secretaries of education and labor will make the announcement to end of the grant winners this morning that takes place at the White House. C-SPAN is covering that event. And those are some of the latest